flower shows in Europe that have some claim to be the finest in the world. Our own Chelsea Flower Show in London and here in Belgium. The Floralese of Ghent. What a lovely place to hold a flower show. The magnificent old city of Ghent and capital of Flanders. A very popular tourist centre and it has everything that you would expect of an old medieval European town. It has its own castle, museums, churches, and of course, lots of ways to spend your money. Your feet are really tired and you think you've seen it all well then this is the perfect place to stop and the streets are lined with beer cellars like this and roadside cafes and strangely enough it was a place just like this that an enthusiastic belgian grower back from london in 1808 thought that they would follow our own royal horticultural society holding regular meetings and in 1809 they had their first show with just 50 plants Five years later, the show was large enough that they could have an international jury to judge. And from there, things have just gone from strength to strength, to the point that we now have over a million visitors pouring through the gates in the nine days of the show. Five years in the planning and 12 weeks in the building, and the facts and figures are quite staggering. You have a hall covering six and a quarter acres, and then you bring in 2,000 lorries with 20,000 cubic yards of sand to make the mounding and the contours right the way through. And then in come 500 Belgian growers with the very best of their produce. Something like 800,000 plants. Again, some of them quite priceless and everyone needing very careful handling. Plants grown under glass with that warm, tender sort of atmosphere, they need to be carefully wrapped bang the blooms and they crack and horrible black marks come. Big house plants too could attract the eye of some foreign buyer, so business is all important. And there's a strong contingent from the British too. We persuaded them to take a moment or two, have a cup of tea and have a word. Nick Butler from London's Royal Parks and Michael Upwood, I think you're responsible for the English exhibit. How did it come about? Well, the Worshipful Company of Gardeners, who have uh, largely financed this, um, were concerned on the last occasion, 1980, that there was going to be no British exhibit, and so raised some money then to stage um, a small garden in another part of the Floralis, uh, and at that occasion went to the Royal Parks for help, and again this time the Royal Parks have helped us marvellously with Nick Butler being responsible for the organisation. So how did you set about it? How much stuff have you got? Um, I was called in to ask to help and um, fortunately had two staff that had worked on the floral lease in 1980. So I picked their brains and started putting uh, some of the material together. How big is it? 300 square metres, um, which is really as large as the last occasion. And we managed to get all the plant material into one Pantechnican lorry a bit of a squeeze um, with a few uh, bent plants here and there, um, the skyrocket for instance, but all the petals um, were, were intact. Everyone works to the same deadline and a few days before you think it'll never be ready. But come the appointed hour, everything is in place. It just remains for the final touches to be given. And the royal opening. King Baudouin and Queen Fabiola meet 
the officials and organisers and builders of this year's Floral Leaves. And it's the start of a whole week of celebrations. That evening, two and a half thousand growers from all over the world met to celebrate this great show and the champagne corks really popped. As you come into the main hall, the strength of colour quite takes your breath away. And it's what Ghent is famous for. A veritable sea of colour. The azaleas in full flower, an absolutely marvellous spectacle. And there are acres upon acres of them, stretching as far as the eye can see in every direction. But in Belgium, it's as if it was nothing, because they grow over 20 million a year. And there are three distinct types. The kind we know best from Belgium are the Indian azaleas. They're the ones in flower from Christmas right round to Easter. They came actually from China, but they won't stand any frost. They've got to be indoors from September to May. And they need to be grafted. They're quite tricky things to grow. And when it comes to specimens like this, they're 20 years or so old. And it's a matter of taking all the flowers off as soon as the show is ended, and then the new growth that comes is pinched several times to make them really bushy shaped in pyramids and globes. And then there are new varieties being introduced. This, for example, the variety Mistral. It has, as an extra bonus, a lovely fragrance. And then the second type, the deciduous azaleas. These we have in our gardens. They get much bigger and much stronger. Flowers quite nicely scented on pretty well all the types. And they have an extra bonus because when the leaves fall in autumn, they go to very rich colours of reds, yellows and purples. Set among the pyramids of Indian azaleas are the Japanese types. I suppose they are rather in between because you can grow them in pots indoors and plant them in the garden. They're pretty well evergreen, although if you get some really tough frosts, such as we had last winter, then as spring arrives, some of the leaves may fall. And of course, there's lots of new varieties. And if you can get a good name, that helps to sell the plant. One which, of course, caught the eye, Lady Di, a very rich pink. And the larger the flower, as a general rule, the more evergreen they are. I know crimson. That's a very popular garden variety. I have it in my own garden. Been flowering for 15 or 20 years. And it's close relative, the pink, Hino Mayo. And the Belgians, of course, famous for their houseplants, Ficus benjamina. A special one, this, the result of cobalt irradiation back in 72, and just enough cuttings rooted now that it can be sold next autumn. The variety, Golden King. And this very plant was seen at our own Chelsea Flower Show earlier this week. And they have nurseries specialising in the hardy alpine plants, Pulsatilla vulgaris beautiful on the rock garden in spring and if you can leave the heads alone then the seed heads are very attractive for flower arranging. The nurserymen in this area of Ghent are as skilled as anyone when it comes to grafting rhododendrons and here President Roosevelt has the advantage of variegated foliage. And for smaller gardens, the Yucushaminum hybrids. Pretty flowers and attractive silver underside to the leaves, the variety Wally Miller. And in the past, the Belgians, of course, were known for their tropical fruit growing, particularly the black grapes grown under glass. But now much of that glass used for uh, the hardier plants, the rhododendrons, and of course the very latest expensively heated grass for tropical plants the evergreen Brunfelsia, the flowers slightly fragrant, originally coming from Brazil. <coughs> Just look at the twisted stems on those bays. You need some patience for that. Once the cuttings are rooted in August, they need to be kept in a very warm, soft temperature so they grow very quickly. And whilst the stem is very supple, you wind it round a piece of inch pipe and then leave it. Once it's set, it's a matter of waiting just 20 years to get specimens like this. And the St. Paulias. The quality, quite remarkable. And another major Belgian crop. It's
it's quite a task, judging plants grown to this high standard. And over 250 judges take part. It's quite a privilege for the British. We provided the chairman of the judges, President Emeritus of the Royal Horticultural Society. Lord Aberconway, as President of the Grand Jury of Honour, how on earth do you start the task of judging here? Well, I don't start it. I have two panels responsible to me. One of them comprised of Belgian nationals who judge the overseas exhibits, the big exhibits, and the other of overseas people who judge the main Belgian exhibits. I come in, in fact, only if either of those two panels, each of equal numbers, fail to agree. And what of the quality overall, then? Oh, quite wonderful. I've never been to the Florida before, I'm ashamed to say, but I hope to live another five years and come to it again. It is quite fantastic. There are hundreds of prizes for the judges to award, ranging from those for complete exhibits down to individual plants, and thousands of pounds to be won. Florilese isn't just Belgian horticulture. Consider the task of shipping great Phoenix dactylifera palm trees like these from Spain. And you may in fact have seen one or two in new shopping centres in Britain. But this is just one of 13 huge international exhibits, each one packed full of superbly grown plants and the design of each reflecting the styles and tastes of each nation. The Germans compete for business, supplying rhododendrons and azaleas, and their growers are very good too. They seem to get that extra uniformity to the plants. Rhododendron, Simsi violacea, perfectly shaped. And they're pretty good with their heathers too. They're used a lot in cemeteries and the graves very carefully planted. But I don't remember seeing this Silberschmelz, silver bells, on a stem as a standard before. It does grow pretty quickly, but you'd need some patience to get it this tall. And the fats hedera, used here for a stem. And if you take note of the word hedera at the back end of the plant, well, then that gives you a link to what's been grafted onto the top to form a neat head, the ivy. Hedera helix, in this case, the variety English. It's something you, that you might have a go at at home. that style of arrangement, straight lines, sort of hardness, plenty of reflection. If you can get some movement from water, well then that helps to attract the eye, although there's so much to see. The quality of these gerberas, outstanding. And different types coming, singles, doubles, sunshine centers. And the thicker the stem and the bigger the flower, the longer they'll likely to last in water. And then further south, Italy. Their outdoor growers have had terrible trouble with frost, but under glass, the orchids, as beautiful as ever. And the style of arrangement this time, using white, weld-meshed wire. And the strelitzia, what an exotic plant that is. Get 20 or 30 of those in an arrangement and sit them beside a mirror, and if the position is just right, they're reflected into infinity. Marvellous exhibit from Italy. From Martinique, the heliconia, or parrot plant. It's closely related to the banana. And another heliconia, this time, carabia. Growing almost out in the wild, the ginger lilies, Alpina cochinia rosea. In the islands of Samoa, they actually fashion these into a chainmail type of dress. Carefully cultivated, the anthuriums. Plants with large bracts that once they're cut, they last a long time in water. And from Czechoslovakia, a lollipop tree and the designer really using his artistic license here. And giving the eyes a bit of a rest too. Uh, not with cat's cradle, but with a macrame work of art. 
they're pretty good with their Boston ferns too. It's nice to get some green to associate with all the richly coloured cut flowers. Five separate halls lead off the main hall, and this is one of them, the velodrome. Normally used for cycle racing, and the banking where the cyclists usually pan round has been covered with a wooden framework, and then polythene in place and more peat to support the biggest collection of plants ever. It's like being in a tropical jungle with all that green foliage and humid, humid atmosphere. And you'll see lots of plants that you see in the building society offices. And of course the stag's head fern, that's a plant which likes moisture. But lots of bromeliads. The Belgians really specialise in those, the sort of pineapple type plants with bright coloured leaves. And the Vresia, splendens, they're raising new varieties. An F1 hybrid here called Splendide. Even larger flower stems and longer lasting. And the Guzmania with that white tip. Lots and lots of plants that you'll recognise. Here's an old favourite. The Clevia miniata. Plenty of watering and feeding in the summer for that. And no, it hasn't been splashed with milk. This is the Swiss cheese plant, but it's the variegated form, Monsteria deliciosa variegata. I should think in the warmth here it may almost fruit. And new plants, the Tetranema mexicana. It's self-pollinating, so you have to keep picking off the flower stems, and there's a lot of them, because one comes with every leaf. It's quite a job picking up those falling flowers too. Do you recognise this? Coffee Arabica makes quite a good house plant. It's evergreen and has those nice white fragrant flowers. And then if you're patient, the berries form and they eventually go red and then black. You can grow it at home on the windowsill, but I'm not sure you'll have enough of those beans to roast and make your own coffee. Another new plant, this time the Mexican pepper, Piper ornatum. It'll grow quite well indoors in the shade just the same as the Phytonia. Well, this is a new one called Mini Red. And we need plants for darkish corners. Oh, and the orchids. Mr. Lefebvre, the designer, he said he wanted to try and get that South American rainforest atmosphere. And so he had wooden framework covered with sacking and then made sticky and peat stuck to it. Lots of moss. And then the different varieties of orchids, all in their pots, carefully positioned. The great spectacle in the main body of the hall is provided by the two Belgian nursery associations. And Mr. Maurice van Nuenberg, you're responsible, I think, for this end. How does this year's floris measure up? Is it all that you expected? Well, we are really surprised ourselves about uh, the whole uh, uh, show. Now, we have the, imp uh, the impression that it is really much better than the years before, when it was already splendid, but uh, it's of course very difficult to compare two shows. But uh, the last one was a nice one, but now I think it's really much more better. And what about the people from overseas then, the international support? Are you pleased with that too? We are very pleased, I can say, because uh, uh, there were a lot of efforts from these countries to bring their uh, own character to the floralists. And we, uh, we saw, for example, uh, the Arab uh, garden in the Spanish uh, garden. Your uh, specialities uh, from the UK, first of all, from the nursery stock sector, and uh, the bright colors from uh, cut flowers from Holland and from everywhere. Really, we are very satisfied. Uh, also from Czechoslovakia, for example, we have seen a quality that didn't show before. Really nice and we are really satisfied with the whole show. The British Garden, and we have quite a reputation because we tend to go out and garden week by week rather than just employing a landscaper to do it for us. And of course the grass. No one can beat us for our lawns and it's the perfect foil to arrangements of conifers and shrubs to look attractive year round. And the fragrant lilac from Brighton Parks Department. That brought a touch of England back to the atmosphere. And a rock garden too. Alpine specialists say there'd be no English garden without a rock. 
and the auricular, the quiet shades. But there's competition for new plants in every category. And from Leicester, a new French marigold. It got second prize. And in two or three years' time, we'll see it named and in our catalogues. And what a piece of inspiration. The British, the only ones to bring a seat, and there was quite a cure to use it. Denmark produces millions of house plants and supplies all of Western Europe. And the epiphyllum. Often we grow it in just a single pot, a three inch or five inch on the windowsill, uh, and train it up a cane. But it's much better in a hanging basket if you've got the space. And here the pink variety, hybrida. Keep it well watered in the summer, but a bit on the dry side through the winter. And mind your own business. No, I'm not being rude. It's the Helzini, also called Baby's Tears. It's quite easy to train and grow over a moss-covered wire frame. Blue Campania, this time raised from seed. The old isophila types we used to raise from cuttings were quite tricky. But the new hybrid's so much easier to grow. And the Osteospermum Eclaris Lisbeth. I felt sure I'd seen this plant before and thought really it was a Dimophotica. When I got back home, I found there is a plant imported from New Zealand called Whirligeek. As far as I can see, exactly the same plant with two names. And tiny cactus in thimble-sized clay pots, the kind of thing children like to collect. It'll be quite a job watering those tiny specimens. Purple and gold, the theme that runs right through the Danish exhibit, and it's needed to hold so many different sections together. From Florida, growers have flown in their ficus benjamina. But the stems, they've been plaited and twisted. They look almost like dancers pirouetting on their toes. The premier award for the international exhibits went to Holland. And it was no surprise, the Dutch had a magnificent exhibit. It stretched on for yards and yards. And the overall scheme, all colour coordinated. Starting with the mauves, purples and lilacs, including the tulips and all the different early flowering bulbs, and then going on to the reds and oranges. And there was some thought given to the kind of plants they used. Gladiolus, for example, will last a full six to eight days in water with no difficulty. And the roses too, cut in tight butt. But you need to stand back to see the designer's skill. Lots of the very best cut flower from Alsmere. The roses and the freesias. All those heavy perfumes mixing. And it's clever the way they keep introducing moisture into the stand. That keeps the humidity up in the atmosphere and really strengthens the perfume. And there's different arrangement style too. Some people say you've been to one of these shows, you've seen them all. But there's great innovation when it comes to flower arranging from Holland. as the international exhibits and the cooperative exhibits from Belgian growers, there are the specialist Belgian nurseries showing what they can do too. And here, a magnificent collection of cactus. All kinds of comments coming from the crowd. Somebody said it looks like a brain, looks like an old man, looks like a twisted finger. But the mammillarias need to be in full flower. Not sure about the sand. And if you see cactus with grey, woolly hair, it usually means they come from colder districts. That gives them some protection from cold nights on the mountain sides. And that great drum cactus, Echinococcus glucinii, almost lost from the, from the wild and now being reintroduced from indoor seed-raised plants.
yet another Belgian speciality, the hydrangeas, moped hydrangeas or hydrangea hortensis. And there are three different types. The white ones are always white, the pink and red ones that are always pink and red, or the pink and red ones which, where the soil is acid, will turn bright blue. But when it comes to growing them in pots, it's quite tricky because the water we have in our taps tends to be a bit on the chalky or alkaline side. So it's a matter of checking week by week just to make sure that the soil moisture has just the right amount of acidity to it. Give it that treatment and then you have absolutely magnificent flowers, perfectly formed, excellent quality. The overall design in the main hall was in the hands of Guido Vinca, and he broke up those banks of azaleas with cut flower works of art. They're supported on clear acrylic sheet, and each one like sculpture. The carnations softened a bit with gypsophila, becoming a major glasshouse crop, both in Israel and Holland. And the viburnum, that greenish tinged flower, fitting well with the white year-round chrysanth, iris and freesia. And then the gerberas. I was telling you about that sunshine centre. You can see them clearly here. Asparagus sporengri to soften those hard plastic lines and some branches of yellow for scythia. As well as that breathtaking overall spectacle, there's also countless smaller individual designs and over 13 different water features and this perhaps the biggest of all with the water tumbling over the logs is the backdrop to the begonias. They were introduced to Belgium back in 1853 and goodness how the growers eyes would sparkle if they could see the variety we have now. The pendulous type, just a job for window boxes and hanging baskets and the flowers getting bigger every time I come. And at the other end of the scale, recently introduced to that non-stop begonias, and they really do non-stop flower. One of the problems is they flower so much, it's a job to get a corm on them. And then the mamoratas, really bright bicolors, and the smaller multiflora. They're fine for neat bedding. Keep those low and nice and damp, and they'll flower forever. But most eye-catching of all, and more than 50% of the begonia corms produced here in Belgium and sent all over the Western world, these large, double flowers in brilliant colours, crimson, white, orange, yellow and pink. And what a job to get them to flower the third week in April. The growers right through the winter have been interrupting their night with two hours of bright light to get them to flower like this. I'm glad I didn't have to judge. The competition gets fiercer and the quality gets higher. But the advantage of one of these shows, held every five years, is that you can really assess the advances made in horticulture. And they are forging ahead with their cultural skills and introduction of better varieties. Already the Belgians are building a new hall for 1990 and planning to stage an even brighter floral spectacular. 